200 years ago, Singapore was a jungle, an obscure tropical island, barely inhabited. Today, it's an Asian tiger, an economic giant. This city-state has no natural resources. Its land is infertile. So why has it lured so many people from around the world, seeking a fortune? Today, Singapore has been shaped by one man, Lee Kuan Yew. He ruled the country for a quarter of a century, leading it into the modern age. But what was Singapore like before Lee Kuan Yew? How did it ever emerge onto the world stage? Unless you know where you came from, unless you know what your ancestors have been through, you have no reference point. What makes us different from, say, the Thais, or the Filipinos, or the Sri Lankans. The difference is how we came here, how we developed, and that requires a sense of history. Singapore's history can be traced back to the beginnings of the global economy and to the ambitions of a maverick British pioneer. He came from a very different world to Lee Kuan Yew, but has left his imprint just as clearly on the modern city. Without him, Singapore would never have begun its remarkable journey. From mangrove to metropolis. Singapore is a tiny island that's been shaped by the grand forces of history. Back in the 19th century, the British were developing a powerful trading empire and had their sights set on Southeast Asia. January 1819, a small expeditionary force has arrived on the island, working for the British East India Company. The leader is a highly ambitious, determined young man, an official of the company. His name would become forever linked with Singapore. He is Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles. He was a man with a vision, ahead of his time perhaps, whereas most of the East India Company officials in this part of the world were basically here for the trade, perhaps for the adventure. Raffles had an idea of changing the world, of making it a better place. Raffles was fascinated by Singapore's history and carried out an archaeological survey of the island, looking for evidence of its glorious 14th century past. Back then, Singapore was an important island at the center of a thriving Malay kingdom. It was known as Tamasic and appears on the earliest Chinese maps of the region. Raffles realized that there had been a former state here, a former kingdom, and in many respects he wanted to, f to create a new Timasek, a new Singapore that would be guided by the British. But Raffles had no legal right to do anything on this Malay island without the blessing of a Malay sultan. The local Sultan of Johor had already ruled out making any deals with the British, but he had a disgruntled elder brother, Hussein, with a rival claim to his throne. Raffles realized this 
and smuggled Hussein into Singapore. Without any authority, he proclaimed him to be the rightful Sultan. In effect, Raffles had carried out a coup. This is where Raffles' understanding of Malay culture, Malay history, Malay texts comes into play. He basically created a Sultan of Singapore, out of, in many respects, out of thin air. Having installed his own sultan, Raffles organized a formal handover of power. Hussein was to receive a handsome salary, but in return, Raffles would be able to run the island as he wanted. This treaty is concluded at Singapore on the 8th day of February in the year of our Lord, 1819. This historic occasion was witnessed by a few dozen sea gypsies, pirates and fishermen who lived on the island. My great-grandfather was there. I say, Mommy, he must, he must be a kid at the time. He, 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 did, he did understand, but he must have remembered a few things, what he saw. That was the first time that we saw a white man coming to Singapore. When they were just aghast, I suppose, and uh, they didn't know, they didn't understand the whole thing about that. With the signing of the treaty, Singapore's history as a Malay island had effectively come to an end. Come to me, face the flag. From now on, it was to be a British settlement in the hands of the East India Company. Company, salute. A blank canvas to be shaped by the vision of one man. Nearly 200 years later, a statue of Raffles stands on the spot where he came ashore. But how was this one man going to turn a swamp into a city? Economy, where goods, people, and ideas move freely across the planet. And Singapore, at the crossroads of great shipping lanes, is a city born of globalization. Ever since the 19th century, its fortunes have depended on the ebb and flow of international trade. Back then, the world's largest corporation was based in London. The East India Company was unlike any merchant company of old. It had its own civil service and army, and ruled over a fifth of the world's population. Its network of trade routes stretched across half the world, and in its heyday, the company generated more revenue than Britain itself. And its most valuable cargo was tea. Since the days of Marco Polo, Chinese tea had become immensely popular in Europe. Half the company's profits came from supplying this one fashionable drink. The British had cultivated a particular liking for tea and the market was growing all the time. The East India Company found that this was a major item for their business and kept the company going. But what could they pay for the tea with? They had relatively little to sell to China to pay for the tea. This was a problem for the company for a long time until they eventually discovered opium.